Good morning, everybody. Please pray with me. Father, we give you thanks for this time to be together with your people and to hear from your word. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us just as you promised to do. And we ask this in your mighty name. Amen. You might have heard of uh, Howard Thurman, civil rights leader, author, theologian, tells the story of when he was a boy, he would read to his grandmother, who having been a slave, could neither read nor write. Two or three times a week, he says, I read the Bible aloud to her. And he continues, I was deeply impressed by the fact she was the most particular about her choice of scripture. For instance, I might read many of the more devotional psalms, some of Isaiah, the Gospels, again and again and again, but the Pauline epistles, never, except at long intervals, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He spent his boyhood perplexed as to why his grandmother would never request that he read the Pauline epistles. One day, about halfway through college, with the confidence of an almost grown man, he summoned up the courage to sit her down near the end of her life and ask her, Grandma, why did we never read from the Pauline epistles? And this was Grandma's answer. During the days of slavery, the master's minister would occasionally hold services for the slaves. Old man McGee was so mean that he would not let a Negro minister preach to his slaves. Always the white master preached. And he always used as his text something from Paul. Slaves be obedient to your masters as unto Christ. Then he would go on to show how it was God's will that we were slaves. If we were good and happy slaves, God would bless us. I promised my maker that if I ever learned to read and if freedom ever came, I would never read from the Pauline epistles ever again. How is it that a religion that announces it is for freedom that Christ has come to set you free could come to justify a practice as malevolent and unholy as what was just described? How could a religion whose central figure ordered his disciples to proclaim good news to the nations, translated from the Greek ethnos, from which we get the word ethnicity, and baptize them and incorporate them into one holy spiritual family contribute to a system where some members of humanity are afforded less rights, less dignity, and less deference than other members of the same baptized family, much less the same human family. It cannot be denied, said Howard Thurman, too often the weight of the Christian movement has been on the side of the strong and the powerful against the weak and the oppressed. This, despite the gospel. It's a pretty perplexing problem, isn't it? It is perplexing for me as a minister of the gospel who since 2006, when God has given me the ability to see past my own blinders to the myriad places in scripture where matters of justice and equity as they relate to race, nation, and a society that I participate in are addressed, nevertheless, I must always make the calculation as to whether or not I can preach on these subjects without being dismissed as woke or liberal. It's a perplexing problem for the people in the pew who must either learn how to explain away such scriptures as if they had an asterisk behind them, like the home run records for those on steroids. <laughs> These don't really count. Explain them away or struggle with the dizzy and disorienting feelings of knowing 
These subjects are in the book, but for some reason are not prioritized by the ministers of the church or the people of God. It is a perplexing problem for those being crushed under the strong gears of the dominant and the powerful who are forced to ask whether or not there are two Christs and two Bibles, one for the rich and one for the poor, one for the mighty and one for the weak, one Christ to justify the one and comfort the other. It's a perplexing problem for those outside the Christian faith who I can tell you because I spend an enormous amount of time around them. They can and have read the Bible. well enough for themselves and are capable of understanding it and are able to see the stunning discrepancy between the words that the church reads and the deeds that the church performs. It is a perplexing problem. How are such problems to be resolved? Some of you are saying they could be resolved by me not coming to church today. <laughs> They can also be resolved by you emailing him and say, don't have him back. <laughs> if God's people find themselves lost and confused, we have a word from God that the psalmist teaches is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. And the scripture that we have today does not speak to the totality of the perplexing problem, but it does speak to some of it. And if you'd like to follow along, I'd invite you to Deuteronomy chapter 10 is where I am. Be starting at chapter 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, to observe the Lord's commands and decrees I'm giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Martin Luther, he is the German reformer that is largely credited for initiating the Protestant Reformation, was commenting on these verses in his commentary on Deuteronomy. And he said, there is no greater consolation that you will more plainly hear or could hear in a lifetime than these words. But he also said that there is nothing you could hear more plainly now or could hear in the future that is harder or more severe than these words. What did he mean by that, that these same words are a source of enormous comfort, but are very severe? Well, there's great comfort in the fact that God is not simply the Lord God. As some of the older ministers that I knew used to refer to him, the Lord God Almighty. I would encourage you never to call him the Lord God Almighty ever again. The problem is not in Lord or Almighty, but it's in the definite article. We're great fans of the definite article in Alabama. We go to the Walmart. <laughs> Luther said most Christians have a personal pronoun problem. It's not the Lord God Almighty, it's yours, Lord God Almighty. Your Lord God Almighty. We spend an awful lot of time reflecting on the fact that we belong to God, and that's absolutely true. I see it in devotions, I've heard it in sermons. Some of you have encouraged me with those words. Rob, you belong to God. It is very rare to remind one another that God belongs to us. He is the Lord, our God. And that's what Luther meant by it's the source of enormous comfort. God belongs to you. This is what I will whisper at every marriage ceremony that I have ever performed. And I whisper it 
Because it's not for you. It's for the bride and the groom. And what I will whisper is, she belongs to you now and no one else. He belongs to you now and no one else. This is your man. And when we enter into covenant relationship with God, he belongs to you. He's the Lord, our God. It's sealed in covenant, a sacred promise. God pledged to be ours and ours alone. Luther was right. It is an enormous comfort. How's it hard? Why might it be severe? Well, the scripture we're reading this morning comes closely after the episode of the golden calf. I don't know if you knew that. You might not even know the story of the golden calf and the shattering of the two tablets of the law. If you're unfamiliar with the story, shortly after God joined himself to this people through covenant in a ceremony close to marriage or adoption, God's own people, immediately after the ceremony, turned away from him to worship another god that they had made with their own hands out of leftover jewelry. Leftover jewelry! This is not a traditional church setup, so Hamilton might not have learned the pleasures of this. But once a year, church people decide to help raise money for the church by donating items to the church for auction. How many paintings forgotten for generations found in the attic have been donated for such causes? Dresses never worn for 20 years. Leftover jewelry fashioned the golden calf. My wife and I are watching The Crown. Anybody watch The Crown? I'm late to it. And my wife is kind enough to go back to the beginning and watch it through. And we started episode one of season two last night. Prince Philip is about to embark on a royal tour around the world. And Queen Elizabeth wants to wish him well. So she sneaks a little present into his briefcase. And as she opens his briefcase to put the present in, what does she find? An intimate picture of a woman who is not his wife. She replaces it with a note. And the note was, remember, you have a family. That kind of note would give me an enormous amount of comfort but it would not give an enormous amount of comfort to Prince Philip. The reason such words can be comforting and severe is because they speak to the faithfulness of the recipient. We have words of comfort and severity. Remember, the Lord is your God, but it's also a severe rebuke to an unfaithful people, a people who chose to craft a God according to their own choosing rather than the God who belonged to them. Remember, the Lord is your God. So we have a doorway through which we can begin to think through the perplexing problem of Howard Thurman's grandmother, old man McGee, and his odious use of the Apostle Paul. God's people are, in the words of the old hymn, prone to wonder. Which is a more poetic way of saying prone to infidelity. Prone to walking apart from the God who is their God. They are prone to forgetting God has made promises to them. They are prone to forgetting they have made promises to God. And when they forget, they will always fashion a God of their own choosing. What kind of God is this who's reminding them? Moments after their infidelity, you have a family. What kind of God is this who has made promises to them, who belongs to them? Well, there are many things we could say about this God, but we'll focus on the scripture in front of us. The Lord your God is God of gods. 
Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. He shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you. He gives them food and clothing. The announcement that God does not show partiality and accepts no bribes is matched with the proclamation that this same God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. And he loves, it says, he loves the foreigner. Hebrew is not like Greek, by the way. Made famous by at least four different words for love. In reality, there's more than that. In Hebrew, there's only one word for love. And it's significant that the scripture says he loves the foreigner. And he loves the people. Because he loves them in the same way. Why are they placed in this order that he shows no partiality and he defends the fatherless and the orphan and he loves the foreigner? Well, there's a really good reason for that. In the ancient world, the orphan who has no advocate and the widow who has no rights and the foreigner who has no resources are particularly vulnerable to oppression and exploitation in society. In today's sermon, I was asked to pay particular attention to that class of vulnerable people that in the Hebrew is called gar, but in English can be translated as stranger or sojourner, alien or foreigner. The original audience would have heard this as non-Jews, and they had a name for them, and that name was Gentile. In the ancient world, in the time of Moses, when this was written, that word was in use all the way up to the time of Jesus of Nazareth, who surely would have heard the scripture you hear read today in his synagogue as a boy. What was Jesus' experience of the foreigner in his own lifetime? What was Jesus' experience of hearing this scripture that we read today, read in his synagogue, and then doing what you must do today, go out into the world. The problems that perplex you that I identified earlier would have perplexed him as well. How do we know that? Well, growing up, Jesus surely would have heard the racial slur, dogs often matched with Gentile, the Gentile dogs. We know that the society Jesus lived in had deep racial divisions. Even though his people would have heard the same scripture you heard read this morning, that God loves the foreigner. We know that Jesus encountered one in John chapter 4, and she said, you do not speak to people like me, a Samaritan. And we know that the court of the Gentiles, a special temple, a special part of the temple dedicated so that foreigners could seek God, had been converted into a cluttered money changing station and was overrun by animals. Because the solemnity of Gentile prayer was what? not worth the dignity of the people of God. All this to say, Jesus had very little experience from the society he lived in of God's love for the foreigner. In other words, Jesus had personal experience of the same perplexing problem that you and I have been speaking of. What is the perplexing problem? The perplexing problem is that, given time, people seem to be prone 
to leaving the God that belongs to them and creating a different one that they prefer. Into this infidelity, God inserts himself, not as a spirit or a book, but a man named Jesus of Nazareth, that the New Testament teaches us is the exact representation of God himself. The exact representation of God himself. How do we know how God would treat the widow? How does Jesus treat the widow? How do we know how God would treat the orphan? How does Jesus treat the orphan? How do we know how God would treat the Samaritan? Or the Gentile dog? How did Jesus treat them? Because he is the exact image and representation of the Father. He identifies with them so closely that by the end of his life, he's considered one of them. There's a variety of ways you could take what I just said, but let me put it to you like this. Jesus is killed outside of the gates because he has so identified with the oppressed and the downtrodden and the outsider that they do not even bother to kill him like they would one of their own. Jesus dies outside the gate. Jesus is crucified according to a custom that was only permitted for who? Non-citizens of the Roman Empire. It's almost as if the two great powers of the story, the Israelites and the Roman Empire joined together to make a decision, this man is not one of us. And they illustrated it by the way they killed him. So Jesus dies as a foreigner. He dies as an outsider. He dies as the vulnerable and the weak. He is one of the people crushed under the gears of society. And as he dies of what, as one of them and is raised as one of them, the people who are perplexed as to who God stands with and for have their perplexities put at ease. Because I challenge anyone to come away with a reading of the Gospels that does not see clearly Jesus' outreach, care, and concern for such people and their wonderfully passionate attraction to that man. Which brings up another perplexing problem. If crucified, he stands with those people. Who is God for the Israelites who rallied round to put him to death? Who is God for? If he's for them, who is he to the Roman Empire that had him nailed to a tree? We can make it more personal. If God stands as vulnerable 
and weak and cast aside if he stands with them. Who is he? For a white, upper middle class Anglican priest who, by the way, is doing pretty fine. Well, I'll tell you who he is to them and to me. He is wed to an unfaithful people and to an unfaithful man. And of the many things the cross is, the cross is God's excruciating commitment to stay married to an unfaithful people. It's his excruciating commitment to stay married to me, to never leave me nor forsake me. He might stand with the vulnerable, but on the cross he prays for who? His oppressors. Forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And I'll ask you a question that a 17th century Puritan named John Owen asked. Do you believe the prayers of Jesus are answered? I do. We might be prone to wonder, but he isn't. What does all this mean for us today? Well, it has a few applications. Here's the first application. The scripture says that God defends the fatherless and the widow, but the same scripture we read this morning says he clothes and feeds the foreigner. But there's a distinction in that verse. God defends the orphan and the widow. It doesn't mean you don't have to. But it says he clothes and feeds them while they're in your land. What's that mean? It means God's great plan to care for this vulnerable class is actually his own people. You and I have an obligation in the wedding vows to be part of what God is doing on this earth. Not just even though that was my assignment to speak for the foreigner, but any vulnerable class of people. God loves them. And his plan for advocates is this church. His plan to care for them is this church. His plan to defend their rights and their dignity is this church. That's thing number one. Here's thing number two. Where this has not been done by this church or people in it, the path home is not an asterisk next to the Bible verse. And the plan home is not justification. The plan home is to confess infidelity and repent, believing that God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the plan home. It doesn't mean that we are all caught up in direct actions. But I do know on Epiphany, my daughter's birthday, also called January 6th, as my son came home from school and saw a swastika go across the television screen next to a flag that said, Jesus saves. We have problems. The path home is not to defend yourself. The path home for me is not to defend myself. The path home is to say, I am utterly defenseless. Have mercy. 
He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Which means he'll never stop troubling you on these things either. He will say to you what Queen Elizabeth said in episode one, season two. Divorce is not an option. Eventually, we will all have to come to terms with this God and execute his plans. That last one's tough. But it's got to be done. And it needs to be confronted head on. Here's the last thing. There are many ways you can be made to feel foreign. You don't have to be from France or Egypt or Mexico. You can be made to feel foreign in this town, if you're from Ohio. <laughs> you can be made to feel foreign in this town, if you're not quite as beautiful as everyone else, or if your skin's a different color, or your English is a bit broken. You can be made to feel foreign in church if you are going through a divorce. You can be made to feel foreign in church if you struggle with belief. There are so many ways you can be made to feel foreign. If you have ever been made to feel foreign, I have scripture for you that right now is only comfort and no severity. And it's this. God loves the foreigner. And so if feeling foreign has prevented you from beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ, if I have made you feel foreign today, I have good news. God loves you and wants to be in covenant relationship with you. And you can begin that relationship today simply by saying, Come, Lord Jesus. I'm not entirely sure what it means. I'm not entirely certain what kind of trouble it might get me wrapped up into. But I do want to feel loved. I want to feel welcome and part of your family. Come, Lord Jesus. And if you need help doing that, I'm sure there are people here who would help you do it. Let's pray. We pray, Jesus, that our many infidelities would not keep us from being reconciled to the man who prayed, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And because we're focusing on these things, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us through the assurance of forgiveness that divorce is not an option we would learn not to defend ourselves, but we would engage wholeheartedly in the work you set before us in these words today. And we ask Jesus that if anyone has been made to feel far off, they would know you love them even now. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.